All right, so I am Caitlin Johnstone. I'm with the Chesapeake Bay Program and the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay. You're joining us for our virtual public forum series. And today we're learning all about blue crabs. So we love seeing them out in the water. We have management strategies to try and keep them around. They're iconic and we love to see them on our, on our feast table. So it's a pretty complex topic, but always a fun one. And we've got speakers from all across the spectrum here to tell you about them today. So let's introduce our speakers. Uh, speakers, if you could come on to video so we can see who you are. Thank you. We have uh, Alexa Galvin, who's with the Virginia Marine Resources Commission. She's a fishery management planner, and uh, she helps coordinate uh, trying to make sure we have enough crabs for our crabbing industry and enough crabs for the crabs themselves in the environment. Dan Knott, he's joining us with the Virginia Watermen's Association, and he's been a waterman for years. We'll tell you all about that. And Dr. Matt Ogborn with the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center. He's a marine ecologist, and he's going to tell you about once we learn about all of those crabs from Kelly, who's our biologist with the Maryland Department of Natural Resources. Matt is going to tell you about how the crabs move and where they go and the importance of them in the ecosystem with habitat and predators. So we'll start with Kelly to give us some background on blue crabs and their life cycle. Take it away, Kelly. Okay. Thank you for the introduction, Caitlin. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about how crabs grow and how that connects with the blue crab life cycle. So like Caitlin uh, mentioned, blue crabs are pretty iconic species to the blue crab region. This species is easily recognized by its hard olive green shell and its bright blue claws you can see in this first picture. Next. Looking at this next picture, you can see that the blue crabs also have these five sets of legs, which are used for different functions, such as the flattened paddle or swimmer fin that you see towards the bottom and the strong, powerful claws used for feeding and defense. Looking at the underside of the crab, you'll also notice differences in the shape of the apron. This is the flap that you can see that covers the abdomen. The males have a long and narrow apron while the females have a more rounded shape and then if you look a little bit closer at the claws, you can also notice that the mature females also have these bright red tips on their claws, which is another further way to distinguish the two sexes. Next. So crabs are a little different compared to, you know, say us where, you know, everything grows in unison. Crabs, however, have this hard exoskeleton and they need to be able to shed this hard outer shell to be able to grow in size. The new shell will start to develop under the existing hard shell and slowly start to dissolve the old shell and then absorb minerals from that old shell as it thickens. The whole process for the new shell to be developed takes about two weeks and you'll start to see the new shell showing through the translucent section of the swimmer fin. And you can see that there is a red line with an arrow in that top picture and that points out that new shell shining through. As the new shell gets thicker, the line will transition from white to red as it gets closer to shedding time. Next. So once the new shell is complete, the crab has to shed the older, smaller, hard shell. To do this, the crab will take in a lot of excess water and it causes it to swell, which puts stress on the harder outer shell. This causes that hard shell to crack along the back providing access for the crab to slowly over two to three hours back out, leaving behind this intact older shell called a shed. You'll notice in the picture that they look different. This is the entire process. As you see, they'll start scooting backwards with the claws being, claws and legs being the last things to pull from the old shed. But you'll start to notice that they look different in color. The new shell is actually very soft and that the crab will use water to inflate this pliable shell to its new size, which can be anywhere to about a 33% or a third bigger than the old shell. Within two hours, this new soft shell will start to harden, but it will take about two to three days for it to reach full strength. So as the, the smaller crabs will shed more frequently, and the older crabs or adult crabs 
um, take longer in between sheds. And so even though the time between sheds gets longer as the crab gets bigger, the male crab will continue to shed their entire life, going through about 21 to 23 molts over the course of its lifetime. Next. However, females are a little bit different. Females will shed only until they reach maturity. When they're younger, the female apron, which is on the left-hand side of your screen, is more of a triangle shape. However, it changes to a more rounded shape when she reaches maturity and sheds for the last time. It's at this point called the terminal molt that mating occurs while the female is still in the soft stage after shedding the old, the old shell. Next. So mating occurs throughout the bay during the summer and early fall, probably about May through October, any place that the male and the females are in the same area. The adult blue crab can handle a pretty wide range of salinities. So the further north you go from the bay, the less salty it is. However, the smaller baby larval crabs require a much higher salinity. Even though mating has occurred throughout the bay, the fertilization of the eggs can be delayed anywhere from two to nine months, which provides an opportunity for the females to migrate to the saltier water that's needed by young blue crabs. Next. I think there's a couple, so you see them migrate. So in the fall, mature females will migrate to the south of the lower bay, and at that time will bury in the mud during the winter. Okay, next. In this, as the Water warms in the spring and the summer, the mature females will emerge from the mud and at that time the eggs would be fertilized. A large egg mass called a sponge forms on the underside of the female crab. You can see in the pictures that it's a pretty large mass that's off the back um, of the crab. Each sponge will hold a few million eggs and that over the course of two weeks, it'll change color from the bright orange that you see on the left to black as the baby blue crabs develop within the egg. While females mate only once, they are capable of spawning multiple times. And so after the two week period, go ahead, the eggs are ready to hatch and the first baby blue crab is released. These larval blue crabs are called zoea. These tiny microscope larvae are filter feeders that drift in the salty water of the near shore ocean for about 45 days. So they just hang out there, they filter feed on various microscopic plants called phytoplankton. So after 45 days, next, they'll go through another molt stage and enter into the next larval stage called a megalob stage. While still microscopic, the megalobi are looking a bit more crab-like and they can swim a bit. After six to 20 days, so on average, probably about two weeks, the megalob will, will molt into a juvenile or first crab stage, which is the final stage of development. While we would now recognize this as a crab, they're only about a fifth of an inch in length at that time. Next. And so as you can see, the blue crab life cycle is complex with multiple life stages and encompasses the entire Chesapeake Bay and near ocean. But even though it's given its complexity, it's also very short. From that time period at the start of the cycle where it transitions to from the sponge crab cycle when the eggs are hatched until reaching maturity takes only about 12 to 18 months. And so just in summary, that which should summarize the blue crab life cycle in the Chesapeake covering all of the different larval stages and the migratory patterns that make sure that the um, mature females can get down to the saltier ocean water that's best for the larvae, and then how they grow from there. And then also shows how biological process such as molting can play such a role in one of the many stages of the blue crab's life cycle, such as mating, and also as it transitions through the different larval stages of, larval stages of development. And I, that should be it. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Kelly. Uh, it's it's fascinating to see, you know, we think of blue crabs as, as what we see on the feast table, but there's so much more to them and at different stages. Um, and you talked about them being out in the ocean or up in the bay. So they move around a lot. 
Uh, so we're going to turn it over to Dr. Ogburn, who's going to tell us a little bit about how they migrate all over the bay, what they're doing out there, and how they survive in those habitats. So take it away, Matt. Yeah, thanks so much, Caitlin. And yeah, I want to build a lot on what Kelly's been talking about with the life cycle. Uh, if you go to the next slide, please. Um, and I want to talk a little bit again about uh, where the crabs are during different parts of their life and also how scientists study them in those different places. And you know, to, to study the blue crab, you do have to go a lot of different places all around in the Chesapeake. So if you're interested in studying them in the first month or two of their life when they're this zoea larval stage, you have to go out to the ocean, sort of in the orange area that's drawn on this at the bottom of the map. Uh, the first month or so of their life, they leave the bay, go out in the ocean, um, they might swim up and down some during that time, but they're not very good at swimming from place to place yet. So they're mostly swimming maybe up to the surface, down to the bottom some, and riding around the ocean currents. And if you want to study them, you need to take a boat out there and pull a really fine mesh uh, net through the water to be able to, to catch these guys and study them, and then use a microscope to be able to see them and count them and uh, watch what they're doing. Next slide. Um, and I, I meant to say that was uh, also during uh, sort of June to, to October, but especially in July is when you can find them out in the ocean. Um, then the megalopus stage, so these are maybe two month old crabs. Um, they are a little bit better at swimming, still not great. Um, and they also ride currents either from uh, water pushed around by winds or storms um, or ride the tidal currents into the bay and they're looking for, for grass beds. They like to find something to hang on to, um, something hard on the bottom. And, and usually they, they come into to grass beds in the lower part of the bay um, and spend some time growing there until they're maybe an inch across. Um, and they're coming into the bay typically between July and November. Next slide. Um, this is an example of, of some of the grass beds. This is actually in Maryland. This is some of my team sampling underwater grasses in the bay, just to give you a sense of, of what the grasses look like that these little crabs are coming in and hiding and, and living in. And they, they come into the grass beds for a couple of reasons. One, it provides protection from fish and other types of predators. Um, and two, they have a lot of food there that, uh, that they need to be able to grow quickly uh, and get to bigger sizes so they don't get eaten. Next slide. Once they get about an inch or so, they uh, start to leave the grass beds and move to habitats all throughout Chesapeake Bay. Um, so this is generally happening throughout the year um, you know, when it's fairly warm. So from, from roughly March to November, um, these juveniles uh, are moving into, into different habitats all throughout the bay. Next slide. These juveniles that are, that are moving up further into the bay use a variety of different habitats. You know, certainly underwater grasses are still really important for them at that time, but we can also find them in different places like uh, woody debris where trees have fallen into the bay, um, along the edges of marshes and in marshes, and also in really shallow water. Um, so for these sort of medium one or two inch size crabs, in a lot of the, the bay, their biggest predator is actually adult blue crabs. So blue crabs are notorious cannibals. Um, and so this, this shallow water that's maybe only an inch deep is really important to avoid being eaten by an adult crab if you're a little juvenile. Um, their crabs are also predators as well. Um, so as they're growing, they uh, start out eating little things like worms. And then as they get bigger and bigger, they move on to, to eating larger things like clams. Um, still worms and some fish and a variety of other things. Uh, because they're eating uh, some of these smaller things or things living on the bottom of the bay and getting eaten by things like uh, striped bass or rockfish um, or even blue herons, um, they form a really important link in the food chain that connects things growing on the bottom of the bay to crabs to some of the larger predators uh, that we like to watch and, and catch and eat in the bay as well. Next slide. So like I said, they're, you know, they're growing up in these habitats all throughout the bay, um, both juvenile males and juvenile females shown here. Um, and then they mate in these same places, um, you know, the, the marshes, the woody debris, the seagrasses all around the bay. Um, and then they migrate down the bay. Next slide. Um, 
and I should say that I said they migrate down the bay. We should say the females migrate down the bay. Um, and one of the ways we, we know this, uh, that females do it and not males, um, is by putting tags on crabs, like these uh, tags that are shown on the, the crab on the right here. Um, we'll, we'll go out and typically purchase uh, batches of maybe 500 crabs a day from uh, Chesapeake watermen, and then attach all these tags and let the crabs go and then see who catches them. Um, and when we've done this, uh, we pay rewards, which are written on the tag. They're either $5, $15, or $50, which helps us understand uh, how well people are calling them and reporting them in to us uh, if they catch them. Next slide. Um, so we've used tagging studies like this uh, to show that females are migrating down the bay like Kelly was talking about. And here's a, a depiction of that female moving down the bay. Next slide. Um, and after uh, she migrates down the bay, uh, also like Kelly said, she typically overwinters near the mouth of Chesapeake Bay in the saltier water. In the spring, you might have some more females uh, from different places in Virginia coming down uh, into that saltier area um, in the lower part of the bay in Virginia. Um, and that's where the, the spawning takes place, uh, mostly from June to September. Next slide. So this is what some of our actual research results look like from a couple of our latest studies of crab migration. So if we put tags on females, and in this map, the, the females were tagged at each of the places where there's a black dot. And then the color of the dot here changes depending on how many days that female was moving around in the bay before, um, before she was caught by either a commercial crabber or a recreational crab crabber. So you see the, the red dots are all pretty close to the black dots, but then as you go to, and that's in the first two weeks after we tag them. But then if you go to the yellow dots, which are within the first month, um, or the green dots, which are more than a month after that crab was swimming around in the bay, those females have pretty much all moved down to the lower part of the bay where it's saltier. So that's how we know females move a lot. And if you're a female in Virginia that we released, or sorry, if you're a female in Maryland that we tagged and released, you have about, uh, 75% chance of getting caught by a crabber in Maryland, about a 25% chance of getting caught, maybe 23% chance of getting caught by a crabber in Virginia, maybe a 1% chance of getting caught in the Potomac River, but some of them actually go out of the bay and all the way down to North Carolina. So maybe one out of 100 crabs that we tag in Maryland gets caught by a crabber in North Carolina. Next slide. We know that's different from males because we've tagged those too. So uh, in these two maps, we tagged uh, males in Maryland at each of the sites where there's a big black dot. And then uh, in the, the two maps, uh, the orange dots are places where commercial crabbers caught those males and the dark blue dots uh, are where recreational crabbers caught them. But the general message here is that the males are moving around still in these habitats where they grew up as juveniles, they're feeding, they're mating with females, but they're not really moving very far. Maybe only 1% of the ones or one out of 100 crabs that we tag in Maryland that's a male actually shows up and gets caught in Virginia. So they're really sticking around for the rest of their life in the places they grew up as juveniles. Uh, thanks for your time and I hope you've learned a little bit about what we do as researchers to study blue crabs. Thank you. So we've heard that uh, crabs have a, a pretty intense and short-lived life cycle. They go through multiple changes and sheds in, in just a year and a half, and that they're moving all over the bay from, might go from top to bottom within a month. So uh, Alexa here is gonna tell us about the very tricky process of trying to manage a fishery with those crabs that are so complex. Take it away. Thanks, Caitlin. You can go to the next slide. So I'm gonna talk a lot about managing crabs, but we can't tell crabs how many of them can go into a pot. What we really manage is the crabbers. So we have a management toolbox that we can use specific tools at certain times to control effort and how many crabs we do harvest. So some of those tools will seem very familiar to anyone who goes fishing. There's a season, you can only catch crabs during this season. There is time of day restrictions. 
There's also day restrictions. For example, in Virginia, you can't set your crab pots on Sunday. We can limit the number of licenses people can have to crab. We can limit the number of pots they can each set. And we also have closed areas. You saw from the last presentation that crabs move down the bay, uh, the female crabs move down the bay when they're getting ready to spawn. Well, we close areas of the high um, spawning ready female population so they can safely release their crabs before they're caught. We also have a, we can set bushel limits. Each of those uh, wooden baskets you see is a bushel. And based on how many, what license you have determines how many uh, crabs you can keep. We have minimum sizes. And then we also have cull rings. In that bottom picture, you can see the orange red circle, which is a cull ring. If crabs are small enough, they can swim out. If crabs are legal size, like the one you see in that picture, they can't fit through. So they get retained for the fisherman to come pick up when he's ready to tend his pots. Next slide. So how do we know when to use these tools? We use the data from the Blue Crab Baywide Winter Dredge Survey. So what is this and why do we dredge? Why do we do it in winter? Well, crabs will, when the water gets cold enough, they'll kind of burrow into the sediment and they'll rest there for the, the winter. They don't swim around, they stay in one place. So the dredge, winter dredge fishery was a traditional Virginia fishery. Um, and so the scientists use that for this survey, all the crabs stay in one place. It's conducted jointly by the Virginia Institute of Marine Science and the Maryland Department of Natural Resources and has been since the winter of 1989, 1990. They sample 1,500 random sites annually from December to March around the bay. Next slide, please. Here's an image from the Virginia Institute of Marine Science Winter Survey. You can see the dredge being deployed off the back of their ship. And on the right are some, are, it's a map of some of the stations they might check for crabs over the winter. Next slide. So that data will give us a graph like this. These are the graphs managers get each year when we're deciding what to do with regulations. So this is a graph of total abundance of blue crabs in Chesapeake Bay in the millions of crabs. The orange line represents the 1990 to 2020 average abundance. When I look at this, these graphs, I tend to see three different periods over the course of the winter dredge survey. And I've got those purple lines the purple vertical lines marking those. And you'll see those over the next couple slides. So the first period we had high abundance, 1990 to 1997, we're doing really well. Then 1998 to 2008, abundance was pretty low. And now from 2009 to 2021, we've had really variable, which is to be expected based on some of the life history, the way the um, zoea drift around, but we've had, years, we've had years of good abundance, we've had years of not so good abundance, but they'll even out. Uh, next slide, please. So what happened in 2008 that we saw that shift? Well, the National Oceanic and Administ Atmospheric Administration declared a blue crab fishery resource disaster, similar to the disaster we see after hurricanes. And they allocated $20 million in disaster relief funding to the affected jurisdictions. Scientists uh, put together a stock assessment, which is a scientific model that estimates the number of crabs and how hard we can fish them. And from that stock assessment came the results that each jurisdiction needed to reduce effort on blue crabs by 34%. And we used a lot of those tools that we discussed earlier. Next slide. So out of that stock assessment, the scientists came together and said, the females are the most important part to getting a good crop of crabs each year. So we're gonna manage based on the female abundance, the adult female abundance. And they set a few levels that we try to achieve and avoid. So that green line you see, 196 million crabs, that's our target. 
we want our adult female abundance to be around there. And then the red line is our threshold, 72 million crabs. If the abundance drops below that, it's overfished. So you can see with those time periods, those purple lines, the low period for the adult females actually starts a little earlier, around 1994. It turns out with adult female abundance low, they had a harder time spawning enough to replace themselves. And so after a few years of low female abundance, we got that long period of low total abundance. That lasted till about 2008. And then after that 34% reduction, we saw the female population do really well. You know, most years we've been, if not over the target, we've been pretty close to it. And, you know, there was that one year uh, below the threshold that was, I believe, an anomaly with the weather. Uh, next slide. So every month, every crabber in Virginia put the, on the Potomac River in Maryland submits harvest reports saying each day they caught this many crabs, usually separated out by um, size, sex, quality. I think uh, Dan's going to speak to that in a little bit. And so we can use that to see how many crabs are being taken. And again, you can see trends with respect to those um, purple lines. Um, you, don't, you don't see harvest rebound as much after 2008, but that's because those regulations we put in place are still in effect, most of them, anyway. Next slide, please. So putting the last two graphs together, we can look at the female exploitation or what percent of females we can safely remove from the bay and what percent of females we are removing from the bay. So the red line is the threshold. If we harvest more than 37% of the females present in the bay, we're overfishing. We hope to remove about 28% of females so that they can safely keep reproducing. So from 1990 to 1997, we were fishing a little high. We were pretty close to the threshold, if not at it, looks like one year, and we were fishing above the target. In those years of low abundance, we were overfishing a good portion of the time. We were over 37%. And then after 2008, we've been actually below the target. So in 2021, we actually harvested 19% of, of the adult female crabs estimated in the bay. Next slide, please. So what do we do with these results? What happens once they come in? So every April, uh, usually, the two surveys send their data to the Chesapeake Bay Stock Assessment Committee, which is made up of jurisdiction managers like myself, um, scientists, academics, all the experts on um, blue crabs. And they look over the data and they make recommendations. Those recommendations with the data get passed to the jurisdiction managers. So that'll be the Virginia Resor Marine Resources Commission, the Maryland Department of Natural Resources, and the Potomac River Fisheries Commission. And they'll decide based on the data and the recommendations what they want to do for the year. And then they present those recommendations to their advisory committees. Each of those jurisdictions has an advisory committee made up of um, stakeholder groups. So in Virginia, our crab management advisory committee has commercial crabbers, recreational crabbers, we have crab processors, and conservation groups. And those advisory committees make their own recommendations. And all of those recommendations will go to the decision makers who will, in the end, decide what uh, management measures will go in place for the next year. That usually happens in June for a July management start. And then come next April, we'll get more data and the process continues. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Alexa. And thank you to all our panelists so far. So we've heard that uh, management of crabs and the life cycle and movement of crabs are, are all pretty complex. And no one knows that better than a crabber who has to read the water and the regu regulations. Um, crabs are not just a part of the science or a part of the environment. They are also inextricably tied to the culture of the Chesapeake watershed. 
So there's no one better to tell you all about that than a Chesapeake Waterman. So I'll turn it over to Dan. Hello, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak to y'all. Um, my name is Dan, like Caitlin said, and I'm with the Virginia Watermen's Association. And our main mission here is, you know, kind of to help preserve the ability to earn a living while working on the water. And you can see the numbers on the slide there as far as the, the number of landings and the amount of watermen that are out there right now. And I get asked a lot why I became a waterman. So I spent about 22 years in the military. And when I was getting ready to retire, I was trying to figure out I was in a bad spot, you know, mentally and was trying to figure out what I wanted to do uh, to earn a living and to kind of find some peace in my own head. And so I look back, my grandfather was a waterman down at Sand Bridge, uh, Virginia Beach, and in North Carolina as well. And so as a kid, all the way up to when I went in the military, college in the military, I, I would work with him during the summer. And it was always so peaceful and I loved being out on the water and loved the work he did. So that's when I decided to be a to start crabbing and become a crabber. So started looking into things and the regulations were very difficult to understand. And so I joined the Virginia Watermen's Association to try and figure that out. And since joining it, um, you know, we really try to preserve that lifestyle and that heritage. And um, one of the things is being involved. So involved in, in the regulatory process, education and uh, partnerships. And so I consider this one of those partnerships. I uh, love getting our story out there and, and kind of really just having a seat at the table. A lot of times I look around the room when I go to meetings, uh, just as a citizen, I go to a meeting and I'm looking at the stakeholder involvement uh, with anything dealing with the Chesapeake Bay. And a lot of times there's no waterman in the room. So, or really nobody that earns a living working the water. So that's something I would say is just always ensure that there's, you know, we have a seat at the table and we are one of those stakeholders. So now onto the next, onto the main topic. So next slide. Okay, so we've already seen kind of what these crabs are. Uh, what we call them and the way I describe it to people is uh, is that Kalanectus sapidus. It's Greek and Latin, and basically it means a savory, beautiful swimmer. And so you see there, you have the Jimmy crab, and I always describe it that they have the Washington Monument on their belly. And then you see the sook or the female crab, and that's the, um, you know, the capital dome. And then you have the pyramid on the sally or the she crab, the juvenile or immature female. Left hand corner, you see the doubler. And, and that's really, you know, we talk about mating and the doubler. It, it's really a beautiful kind of a, one of nature's neatest uh, love stories that you'll hear about. And so that male will find that female about two or three days prior to her molting, that final molt between the immature female, the sally, and the uh, mature female sook. And he'll hold on to her until she sheds. And once she sheds, that's that's the vulnerable time for her and also the time where they can mate. And so they mate and then he holds on to her again to protect her for another two to three days until she hardens up and protect herself. So it's a pretty fascinating story and, and really remarkable. The next slide is the sponge crab chart from the uh, Virginia Marine Resources Commission. And that's kind of where I know what I can keep and what I can't keep. Certain times of the year, I can only keep the bright orange sponge crabs. Certain times I can't keep any. And then sometimes I can keep them all. It's all based on the science and when they're, the mortality rate's high on them or when they need to go lay those eggs and, and replenish the species. So next slide. And so now we see, uh, you know, we have our own language. And what we do with the terminology here is you've already heard about the, the sooks and the busted sooks, the sponge crabs and the doubler. Um, when you go to buy them, you hear, you'll hear terms like whites versus dirty crabs versus ones, twos, and threes. And that's really the language for the, uh, you know, the consumer. So the whites, after they shed, their, their bellies become this, this really bright porcelain white. And that white is, um, it just shows that they're a recent shed. And so what happens is you can take your thumb and push through the belly of those crabs. There's no meat in them. They have water in there and it's just very little meat because they've shed to grow. And so until they can fatten back up, they'll be white and very light. So they're real light and there's just not any meat in them. So very cheap crabs versus the dirty ones. So you really want to get them when they're dirty. And you'll hear that they kind of describe it as a horse's teeth. It'll, it'll go from really white to kind of a tan color. And that's on the belly. You want to get those really rusty looking crabs that are dirty because that's the fattest crab has the best meat in them. And then you see ones, twos, and threes. So number ones are your jimmies that are five and a half inches and above. 
number twos or jimmies between five and five and a half. And that's point to point on their back. And then the threes are your sooks. And so you'll hear other terms like uh, selects and peeler crabs. And that's just a way to kind of figure out what you're getting. So speaking of peeler crabs, you have the signs. You saw where they peel and you saw that swimming fin where they talk about the, uh, um, you know, when they molt and pre-molt. And so those peeler crabs are pre-molt crabs, pre-shed crabs. And those signs, the white, the pinks, and the reds, that's just the time frame of when they're going to peel. So you see the, the white is about two weeks. The pinks is about a week. And then if you see the red sign, that's about, uh, you know, within a, a day or so, they're going to peel. And then the rank peeler is going to be within hours. And that's when they go into the shed tanks. And uh, people check those things about every two to four hours to make sure that they uh, pull them out in time to protect those crabs. And so those guys, and then, and then they, once they shed, you get your soft crabs. And those terminology at the bottom, all the way from mediums to whales, those are the dif different size of soft shell crabs and basically determines your price. So, and then with those, uh, with the pictures of the bat bushel baskets, that's just kind of a demonstration. I picked those pictures to show in the summer, you'll see the back of the truck. I have about 18 bushels there. That's about a thousand dollars worth of crabs during the summer because they're in the shallow waters. Uh, you catch a lot of them. It's anywhere from uh, six foot to about 12 foot is typically what I work. So I have short lines on the crab pots. And then in the spring, though, that's five bushels or so of crabs. And that's about a thousand dollars as well. And in the spring, you have to go deep out into the bay, 30, 20 to 30 foot of water because the crabs are just coming out of the ground from burying. And you got long lines on your pots, about 65 foot. It's a lot rougher in the spring. And, and the demand is up. So you see that on the cost there. So next slide. So what do we have to do to get there? So this is the life of the work, crabber, the prep work. And you'll see, I make my own crab pots. And so you see that process there and what to do with the old pots because there's always a lot of old pots sitting around. Uh, I work and, and I catch my own bait. That's JC, our uh, president right there. Him and I go out and uh, fish a lot of gill nuts to catch our bait because that's my biggest expense is bait. And over the last few years, it's really gone up from about $12 a flat to about $24 a flat. And I use quite a few of them a day. And you'll see the, uh, the rest of it there loading up the crab pots. And uh, next slide. And you got a little bit more of the, uh, of the life of a crabber. And just about every waterman I know does all his own maintenance and, and boat work. So that's kind of pictures there. And then more loading of crab pots. You're always picking the crab pots up, moving them, bringing them in to wash them. And it's a pretty labor intensive process. Next slide. Now we're on to the good. So on the good side of it, and this is really why I do it, uh, the, the sun rises in the serenity. So day starts about 4.30 in the morning or so, if not earlier. Uh, I'm usually out, on, out at the boat around 4.30 and you get to see all the sunrises. You get a lot of friends that visit you from nature and from uh, and humans. So I got my buddy pelicans that are always around. I have uh, my wife goes out with me a lot, uh, friends, kids. I think one of those pictures is my preacher that went out with me. And then a VIM student who I volunteered to have him on the boat for a summer. So about eight weeks, he was on the boat and uh, we worked one of his studies. So you get to kind of see the range of things. Uh, next slide. But with the good also comes the other. And so uh, here you see the weather forecasts have been very unpredictable and unreliable uh, over the last few years. And so uh, that was a storm that uh, was not supposed to be that bad, ended up getting 60 mile an hour winds in the creek and uh, waves were coming over the back of my boat. So uh, that was unfortunate. And uh, pollution and, and water quality, we're really fighting against that pretty much every day. The pot down there in the center, that's grasses that collect in the spring a lot of times. And that is really uh, probably about a 70 pound pot. And then on the left, that's just kind of some testing that I've done along with other watermen as far as turtle excluders and some biodegradable panels. And the good thing about that, we volunteered to do it and we also uh, did it officially for BMRC is just to kind of get the, uh, you know, get our own data and research done so we can, a couple of years ago, they tried to mandate through legislation uh, using biodegradable escape panels. And with the research I had done officially through VMRC, I was able to send that to the legislature and fight the lobbyists off and, and kind of got that bill shot down. So, and then the overregulation. Uh, there's a lot of regulations. As a 
22 year veteran of the military. I flew helicopters and I swear <laughs> all joking aside, it was sometimes easier to fly to take a helicopter and fly up to Washington DC than it is to learn how to crab. You know, there's a lot of regulatory agencies that are out there trying to do the right thing, but sometimes the, uh, impact and the socioeconomic impact to those uh, regulations isn't necessarily uh, helpful. And um, so anyway, that's just something I think of. At any given time, I can be stopped by four different Marine patrols and, and checked. Uh, and, and that does happen on occasion where you see about four different law enforcement agencies out there looking for different things that uh, stop and, and check the commercial crabber. So next slide. So what can you do to support the waterman? So um, first of all, buy direct and buy local. If you can find a waterman to buy from, that's the best thing you can do, but pay more than wholesale price. A lot of times the waterman will sell the crabs for what they would get for, get for them at a wholesale. But if they're gonna get $40 a bushel at wholesale and those things are selling up in Maryland for a hundred and some dollars a bushel, um, you know, pay them a little more, tip them, give them 20 bucks extra. Cause that's, that's just helping the supply chain and not, you know, shrinking the price down. And then secondary, you could buy uh, from a seafood wholesaler or, or, you know, somebody that supports the waterman. Or third, a seafood business that knows where the seafood comes from. And, and, and some of these third party sales or restaurant say, or uh, uh, grocery store sales, you know, really is kind of getting the Walmart effect when it comes to the crab prices. And really it doesn't benefit the waterman that all that much. So make sure it's coming from. And if you buy direct and you buy local, you don't have to worry about some of these things about Seafood Watch and the MSC certification. And I'm not necessarily saying they're a bad thing, but when it comes for local crabs, you know, you take for instance, the Monterey Bay Seafood Watch right now has Virginia and most of your Southern states blue crab as a void, but yet the same blue crab coming out of Mexico, they list as a uh, good alternative. And they even say on their own website that the good alternative from Mexico, they do not know the status of the crab stock. Whereas in Virginia, they say that it's healthy and it's managed very well. Um, but yet they list it as a void because of uh, turtle excluders for the diamondback terrapins and which even VMRC will tell you is more of a recreational issue and not a commercial crabbing issue. Six years I've been crabbing, I've only encountered three diamondback terrapins in my pots. It's just not where I crab. So just something to think about when you see those ratings. I'm not, like I said, I'm not saying they're bad, but they, they, they have their uh, political issues just like everything in the world today. Uh, and then down there at the bottom, must watch. If you haven't watched Beautiful Swimmers Revisited, you can Google that. It's a PBS documentary. It's about an hour long. It is a wonderful, just absolute fascinating uh, documentary that was done on the book by William Warner, uh, Beautiful Swimmers. And it, it brings tears to my eyes every time I watch it. So please take some time to look that up. It's free. You can watch it online. And uh, it, it's absolutely amazing. If you want to see what's going on in the environment, how science is working to protect the bay and how watermen make a living doing it, it it's absolutely fascinating. So, and once again, I really appreciate the, uh, the time and uh, thank you very much. Great, thank you, Dan, and, and to all of our panelists. We could have our, our panelists come back on video so that the, the audience can see you. I know we've thrown a lot of information at you in a very short amount of time. So at the information that you heard today, the very next slide lists resources and you can go and find out more, uh, watch the Beautiful Swimmers video, get some education, look up the regulations, see how the management is going, um, take a look at those resources. But for now, go ahead and uh, any questions you have for our panelists, please put them into the Q&A box if you're joining us on Zoom or uh, comment if you're watching live with us on Facebook. And we heard that the crab process is, is really complex. Um, but it kind of takes everyone learning about the science of the crabs, uh, learning about the crabbing process and, you know, fishing them out on the water and making sure that it stays in balance with the ecosystem and across multiple states, which is why partnerships like this are, are really important. Um, so now that we have several different partners on here and can ask in a panel, please, public audience, we would love to hear from you and answer any questions you might have. Um, if we don't have any in the box yet, we'll go ahead and start with our game here. 
So we heard uh, we've got scientific terms and we've got uh, management terms and we have waterman terms for all these different types of crabs. Um, so go ahead and look at the box and panelists, is there a particular number here you'd like to start with to ask our audience of, of what we're looking at here? I always like the, the different names for number six on the list. Oh, that was my favorite too. Um, so audience, please put your answers in the box. Number six, so down here at the bottom right, what is the management or scientific term for this type of crab? And what is the waterman term for this type of crab? And while you're putting in your answers, we can go ahead and take one of our questions that came in. Uh, it looks like we have one from Ann Quigley. She says, what is the role of salinity in reproduction and life cycle? And why do they spawn in higher salinity? Yeah, I can jump in on that one. Um, a number of scientists have been wondering that same question. So it's, you know, it's a great question. And um, if, you, if you study the, 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 both the eggs and the, the larvae, the baby crabs, once they first hatch, um, they, you know, they, they're not very good at being adaptable to different salinities. And so if, if you put them in water that's not very salty, they, they just die. Um, but as they grow, as they become megalope, um, when they get about two months older and as they, they start to look like crabs at two or three months old, um, on their gills, they start to develop, you know, because they, they get their oxygen from water, um, like more like fish do rather than breathing air like we do. Um, but their gills start to develop these specialized cells um, for helping them deal with uh, lower salinity water. Um, so the, the really young ones, the zoea, don't have those, so they can only live in high salinity water. Um, but as they become megalope and then juveniles, they develop uh, these parts of their gills that help them survive in low salinity. Thank you. It looks like we have a question from Casey Hughes. Um, but before I read that, I'm going to say I'm not seeing answers to the poll question. So go ahead, take a guess, put your answers in there as we keep answering questions from the audience. Uh, Casey Hughes would like to know, on average, how many crabs make it to full maturity from a single batch of eggs? I think we can only guess. So I'm curious what other people's guesses are. Mine is like one or two. Yeah, I agree with that. That's usually, I think what I, my guess would be. Sorry, one or two percent or one or two crabs? What, like two out of a few million. Yeah, so, you know, if you, if you have, very, you know, even fewer than that surviving, the population would disappear. Um, but if you had a lot more than that, we'd be totally overrun with crabs, and that's not happening either. So, you know, the for each female to replace herself and maybe the male that she mated with, uh, that would be survival of two crabs out of the you know, couple million that uh, that she gave birth to over her life. Wow, and, and we heard from all the presentations that a, a lot goes into whether or not those crabs survive to adulthood. So not just if they're if they're caught uh, by a commercial or recreational fisher uh, when they're adults, but are they actually making it back up to the bay? Are they being eaten by something? Um, are they able to survive by using underwater grasses as a nursery? So there's a whole lot to it. Um, and, and it looks like we have a question about one more factor that so Jamie Kretsch would like to know, is anyone monitoring water temperature and the effects of climate change on crabs? I can answer that a little bit. Um, there are currently studies going, ongoing. Um, one thing is that blue crabs have actually been identified as a winner of climate change. Um, as a whole, they'll take it on their own. They might prosper 
with warmer temperatures, um, less time of overwintering. But one of the problems is that increased water temperatures, uh, decreased water salinity will lead to less bay grasses and sea grasses like um, Dr. Ogburn talked about, which the crabs do rely on for habitat. So we don't know for sure if they'll, which way they'll come out in the end, um, but there are a few factors going in that could be positive and could be negatives. Yeah, and just to, to build on that answer uh, a little bit, you know, we have blue crabs that live year round in places like New Jersey and New York. So places that are colder than here in the Chesapeake and also in places like South Florida where it's a lot warmer throughout the year. Um, so we're kind of in the, the middle of their range. So if the temperature goes up a little bit for the crabs themselves, it's, it's not likely to be a, a big problem for them because they, they do live in places that are a lot warmer than here. And I would like to add to that as well. Um, I would say as far as, you know, water temperatures uh, changing, I think that definitely affects the other species that will impact the blue crab. So you have a lot of uh, fish now that are migrating further north and their home territories are, are becoming further north. And within the Chesapeake Bay and some of the rivers, you're seeing a lot of record sized fish being caught not to mention the predators like the invasive species, the blue catfish. You know, one of the high, one of the largest blue catfish was caught recently up near, uh, up in the Rappahannock River, like 119 pounds. And if those fish are eating about three, half to three quarters of their body weight a day, and one of their main sources of food is the blue, blue crab, uh, you know, what's the impact? So could that be some of the changing dynamics of fish migration? Could that be affecting the low juvenile abundance that you saw in the winter uh, dredge survey this year. And so uh, that's something definitely to keep, uh, keep an eye on. And then also with Kelly's question that she just asked, the blue crab yield this year. Springtime for me was one of the best springs I've had, but then turned around at the end of May, beginning of June, the crab count just dropped off to nothing. That was that first kind of full moon in June where you get all your soft shell crabs. And, and usually it picks back up a couple weeks or a week or so or two weeks after the full moon. This year it didn't. So I've got crabbers that, that are reaching out to us telling us that this is one of the worst years they've seen in about 50 years. Not sure why, but it is really, really uh, a, a poor crab season and uh, not sure whether it's predation, you know, water quality are probably the two first things that come to my mind. And when I say water quality, Crab pots are only lasting about a week to two weeks right now in the water. You have to pull them and wash them because they're getting that dirty. Zinks are getting blown off of the uh, crab pots. The sacrificial anodes are getting blown off the crab pots very quickly. And, uh, and, and the wire on the crab pots is corroding. You, you're lucky to get a year, possibly two years out of a crab pot now, whereas before you would get you know four or five years out of a crab pot. So the, so the water conditions and the quality is definitely changing. I don't know what the cause of it is, but I think it's all circling around to show very low crab yield this year. So I'll be curious to see how the rest of the season ends up. Thank you, Dan. And I just to, for those that are, are not watermen, a, a zinc is a sacrificial piece on a crab pot so that the zinc gets eaten away and not the pot itself. But as Dan said, that's, it's not helping. Uh, your pots are still lasting, you said two weeks, Dan? When I say two weeks, that's for the weeks. growth on the crab pot. So we have to bring them in and wash them about every two weeks. Whereas before you could put a crab pot out in the spring and maybe bring it in once for the season. And when I say that, I'm talking my own experience within the last six years since I've been crabbing. So there's old timers that'll tell you that they used to be able to put a crab pot out in the bay and leave it there the entire year and never bring it in and have to wash it. Now uh, you're getting about a week to two weeks and those pots have to come in and be washed because you physically can't even see through the pot because of the growth, the grasses that are growing on it. And, and, and you know, some people would think, well, grass growth, that's a good thing. No, it shows that there's too many nutrients in the water. And that's what's spawning all of that growth and that algae and buildup on those pots. 
So yeah, it's to me, it's not a healthy sign at all. Yes, and you have underwater grasses that the crabs will, that are embedded in, in the bed of the bay that crabs will use as nurseries. You also have macro algae, which looks like grasses, but they're free floating and they, and they catch on to things. Um, and the question that, that Dan read from Kelly, I'm just gonna read that out of the Q&A box for the audience. Uh, she said, this year has been a very low blue crab yield in the James River and the Nansman River and rare crabs found in small fish nets. So talking about the winter dredge survey has high, the, the female count is good, but the male and juvenile crab numbers are low. Uh, any thoughts on that outcome for 2021? So that, that's what Dan was just answering there. Yeah, and I think you know, from my perspective as a, a scientist, it's something that I'm really watching as well. I mean, we're you know, both very excited that the female numbers are doing as well as they are. You know, there, there was this period that, um, that we heard about earlier in the, you know, the 90s and early 2000s where the, the numbers of females that were reproducing were low and just stayed low. And we, you know, we expect the crab population to be really good some years and not so good other years, but when it's low and stays low, that was really concerning. Um, so that's why those management changes were put into effect. Um, so things are much better than, than they were. Um, we're above the, the minimum numbers that we've been trying to stay above uh, uh, in almost every year since then. Um, we're also still not averaging around the target level either. So there have been a couple years we've been up above the target level, but not every year. Um, so things are you know, better, but not great. And um, definitely watching and, and thinking about the numbers of, of juveniles and, and males that keep declining, even though there's females there that should be uh, producing a lot more of them. And uh, you know, definitely something to, to keep an eye on and that we're continuing to think about. And you know, sort of related to that, we, we heard about the stock assessment model, uh, sort of population model of crabs that's used to manage the fishery. And you know, that in general seems to be working really well and, and we're following that and that's really helped improve things since 2008. Um, but it's not, um, you know, it doesn't necessarily reflect all of the different changes that might happen. So it, you know, the current one doesn't have climate change built into it. It doesn't have um, changes in water quality built into it directly. So there, you know, there are things, um, you know, things sort of outside of, of that particular model that can also affect the population. And so we need to be keeping an eye out for those things and trying to understand them. and. Um, you know, maybe the, the next generation model will be better able to include some of those things too. But it's, it's something that the science community is continuing to, to keep an eye on and think about how, you know, how we can keep advancing the science to, to better support the fishery and the crab population into the future. All right, thank you. And for those of you that were looking at the, the last slide, the who am I? Still put in your, your questions there, even if it's just a guess. If you're on the Zoom webinar, type into the Q&A box your answer to number six rather than a question. If you're joining us on Facebook Live, just comment on the video itself. So we're looking at that, that sixth crab there with the triangle shape on its, its belly, its apron. And uh, Rachel, you can go right ahead to the resource slide. Make sure everyone has a chance to see this. So we heard a lot of information today. If you would like to learn more from any of these organizations, you see that over here on the left, that's the main website. And then we also have videos for you to check out. So 101, learn about blue crabs, uh, the beautiful swimmers revisited video that, that Dan told you about, there's that link right there so you can access it. And then if you'd like to learn about crabbing in general and the regulations for it, about the management process or about, um, just education, if you, if you were really interested and you wanna find more about blue crabs or, or see close-ups of what it looks like to have that red sign so that you as a, as a someone out there, you know, looking at say a crab swimming through the water, you can check and, and know, oh, he's gonna be, he's gonna shed his shell in five days or an hour. Uh, start to learn that information. You can find out in the blue crab education. Right, and uh, 
I think Jake, you are monitoring Facebook for us. Do we have any responses on what's our crab number six on Facebook? No, Caitlin, I don't see anything yet. No one brave enough to guess. All right, how about here on, on Zoom? Do we have someone answer? Oh, Ann Quigley, uh, her guess is number six. She said it's a pyramid crab or a she crab. Our panelists is Ann correct? I think there, there were a couple of other answers in there too that sort of I think disappeared into the answered questions part. So I, I was saying that, so I, I think she's right. Um, other panelists, feel free to jump in too. I, I was saying that in our research lab, we call them PP females, which stands for prepubertal female, um, a female that's about to be mature the next time she molts, but not quite. So that's when we see these, we call them PP females, but that's not what most people call them. You yeah, also yeah. call it an immature female. Yeah, that's what I, I, I was going to say immature or Sally, and uh, and that one in particular, if you see the the color that's on its in the pyramid, you see the kind of pinks and and a little bit of the dark shading. That means essentially she's what we call a rank peeler. She will peel within probably two hours. She's going to bust out of that shell. Yep, and that's that's what I was looking at too. That color. Um, so if they just have the triangle but not that color, we call them immature females. But once they develop that color that you call a rank peeler, we call them PP females. Nice. So whether it's a book and and lab knowledge or traditional knowledge, there's a there's a whole lot that goes into crabs and crabbing and and keeping this iconic resource in in the Chesapeake. Um, we're now at one o'clock, so I want to thank all of our panelists for joining today, and uh, hopefully we can we can keep up these partnerships and and keep up these interactions as we move forward in the Chesapeake. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>